see what happens. Here we are on the 25th of June, and you're 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 wearing a uh, not a cardigan. You're wearing a, wearing um, a sweatshirt. A sweatshirt, sweatshirt. A hoodie. Yeah. A hoodie. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, I'm one tough dude. <laughs> I was gonna say. Uh, well, you go down to buy your two cans of Schlitz <laughs> with your hoodie on. <laughs> Can I see your card, sir? Of course, of course there were no, uh, the magazine rack is long gone. So you're just <laughs> oh, standing there with the, where the magazine rack used to be with your hoodie on. <laughs> I can yeah. just see it. No, no, I just, it's just Saturday night review. I'll just take that. The rest of them will come with me later. <laughs> Saturday night review. Oh, uh, it is, it's almost chilly. We're, God, we bitch it when Did it's you hot. Have the heat we on this bitch morning? when it's cold. No, no, no. Oh. It's uh, it's I, I like it cool, but um, and I have to mow yeah, the I've lawn got a different, tomorrow. Uh, thermostat. My my wife uh, likes it really, really warm. Although yesterday did did get to her. Yesterday was a son of a gun. Yeah, right. I got to mow the lawn tomorrow. I was I was told today, but it's new oh, this turf. This is the new this turf. This is the new turf. So How it is has it taking? It appears to be taking fairly well. We've been lucky. We had our permit to water, but it has to be mown to a, a, a minimum height. Is it a maximum height? No, a, a minimum height. Uh, yeah, you'd be careful about that too in the direct sunlight because you can burn it. So I have a, a, a manual push mower that I'm going to have to fiddle with tomorrow, and then uh, Madame's going to be out there. <laughs> Madame's going to be out there with a tape measure. And a laser, and the laser level going yeah. now, now, <laughs> and then I'll, you know, and you'll see me after this with looking like this with four missing fingers and uh, with the. Is this a new purchase this morning? No, had this it for we've many had this. A year? It's a one of these Scandinavian things. It's not a husk, Husqvarna. It's, it's a hooty hooty motor. Husqvarna. So and, you got. Uh, it's, and it's adjustable. So you're going to be swearing in Swedish. Oh, yeah, it's adjustable. And I'm going to be cursing in, uh, in most Scandinavian dialects some, around this time tomorrow. Why do you have to mow it tomorrow, necessarily? Oh, no, no, Let this it is, it's, all, it's, all, it's all been planned out. Oh, okay. Yeah. The rain so came I'm just, at a certain time. I'm being time. a bet noir, am no, I? No, you are, yeah. You're just yeah. being a shit disturber right now. Right. Because, yeah, yeah, no, you're stepping. I'm the, lamb, I'm the lamb shit in the bed. You're stepping on my blue suede shoes. So we're going to okay. find out. Uh, we have an will, electric mower. Why don't I you get the kid down pictures. the street? I will take photographs. Well, actually, sound would be best, <laughs> I think. If you had to choose, if you okay. get both, great. So I'll cover off on that probably on Monday or something, since uh, tomorrow we, we've got other things to do. <laughs> After the wounds heal. Dee -dee, dee -dee, dee -dee. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you left your leg, sir. Oh, God. Mowing the lawn, an adventure in hell with oh, Yule I, Gibbons. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you that. Anyway, Peter Downey is in the waiting room. So let's bring God, him in God, he here. showed up. He showed up. So we'll see. I haven't seen Peter in... Um... He's probably not aware. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. That he's looking... seems to be the look. Look at the size of the house. He's, he's looking very, morning. Uh, very properly okay. groomed. Can... Good morning. And, and properly Hi. groomed. How are you? I shaved. He shaved. Yeah, you look great. <laughs> he, a burly. Yeah, I, I see you dusted, too, from what I can tell here. So that's very about impressive. A about a three foot path behind me I cleaned. I think everybody's zooming. <laughs> I was going to ask you to move the camera, but that might be a problem, huh? What do you, you want me to move it? No, no, well, no it's, a, just, it's a beautiful home. We're getting here. We're, we got a good shot of the credenza here and the piece of, uh, of art above it. So we're doing very Which well. Which way do you want to move it? No, we're good. It's, we're, it's the law of thirds, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Is that okay. Dave? Just, Dave just Dave's being just different. being a pain in the ass. Well... <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> I remember I had a long chat with Peter once, and he sat there, and at the end of it, he just looked into his hands and said, Jesus wept. <laughs> That's pretty much the reaction I got from Peter most of the what, what are you living in, a curling club? Look at the size of the place. <laughs> God. I was thinking last night, do you remember the last time that, that we were in an interview situation? You probably don't. I, I it, was, it was for the jazz festival. And I had right, been, okay. I had been, I was trying to remember last night, I think I had been in Bangladesh. So I came home in, to Toronto on 
for Man Alive. I came home to Toronto on Thursday night, got up like I was there for 38 seconds, got on a plane, came to Montreal, went into a meeting with Katie and Alain that, you know, those two when they get going about jazz. And I thought, I've got, I've got to, I'm just running on fumes. I've got to find a place to relax. So I went to Alain, their office, and somebody this grabbed Alain de Grosbois, the producer. Yeah, yeah. So Just somebody, um, we're not taping. This isn't it, is it? Oh, yes. We're no, rough and running no, no. here. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't worry. We, we've got a list of questions. Yeah, it's okay. Good. okay. So I, I, anyway, I, uh, um, I, as I say, I was running on fumes and I, just as I was going to try to sleep for a couple of hours before the live broadcast, uh, somebody said, oh, you, uh, we've kind of volunteered you to go do an interview with Dave. And I said, well, no, Katie, Katie knows, Katie knows a lot more about this than I do. I could barely remember my name, let alone the lineup for that night. And I came down and it was, I, it was just the worst, not your fault. I, I was, it was the worst interview. Uh, and we had to stop. I don't know. I think we stopped twice to, to restart. No so kidding. Thank, so thanks for this invitation. Well, you're welcome. You're absolutely welcome. That was a scintillating story, by the way, too. That was. Uh... Well, Peter knows nothing of jazz. You you know less than I do. Well, I don't know how much you know, but yeah, you're right. I don't. Um, uh, I know the Preservation Hall Jazz Band that one year. <laughs> yes. No wonder we had make, to stop twice. Well, they make Betty White look like like a youngster, <laughs> right? I don't mean that in any cruel way, but all you could hear <laughs> in the studio as they were playing, about every five minutes, you'd hear somebody go, you all right? <laughs> you all right? <laughs> <laughs> that live broadcast was, was, was so much fun, you know, to oh, do. Oh, God, they so, were great. Yeah. I, how, yeah. Many did, how many did you do? Oh God, I want to say seven, maybe seven, eight years. The problem was Alain got too good at it. Mm -hmm. So it didn't sound live. I mean, it sounded like a recording, you know, um, but I, but it was, uh, I think it was his legacy. I mean, he, his rapport with the, with all, you can imagine the technicians and the sound people to, to get that good in a live recording. And, um, he was just masterful. At, at he loved that. the guys. Yeah, they loved oh, yeah. them. They yeah, just yeah. loved them. Yeah. Because yeah. you guys were on the first couple of times, I'm, I'm thinking, until the last show was over, right? There was no particular time period at that time. You'd start on a Friday night, right, and go into Saturday morning? Yeah. Yeah. Usually yeah. sort of one thirty two in the morning. Um, oh. And yeah, it was, it was a long night. But as I say... The, once that all the technical stuff was, you know, those hurdles were uh, were uh, dealt with, uh, and there were many. Like at first, to get really good sound, it's a real expertise, and I land and the technicians sort of figured out how to do it. And it it was, I mean, it was, became easy to, uh, for me. I mean, I was just sitting in the studio listening and hoping nobody tripped on a wire <laughs> and unplugged things, <laughs> which happened once. <laughs> Yeah, Peter, can you fill for about 20 minutes on Mo Kaufman, please? He just died. You yeah, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but Katie, it was adrenaline for her, and she did all yeah. the running around. She went from yeah. club to club to club, right? Yeah, yeah. My yeah, God. And, and was sort of the eyes and ears on the street. Well, we had, I can't remember who, I think it was Philip Sporer. Do you remember Philip? Oh, sure. Yes. Philip did the uh, arts show. reports for Home Run. Right. So uh, Katie... Um, was so sort of um, um, frazzled, running from place to place to place. She really couldn't give us a sense of what was happening on the streets. And you know, I mean, it's just a magical time in the city or, you know, not this year, but hopefully next summer. And so we hired Philip to go out and just occasionally give us reports of, um, of, of the color and the, and the um, general sort of at atmosphere on the, on the streets of Montreal. So it became, it, it's still one of my favorite broadcasts, you know, because it just, it captured, um, especially if it was 38 with 100% humidity. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, it's only Montreal can have. <laughs> yeah, do you, yeah. Do you miss it, Peter? Uh, jazz? Do you miss radio? Do you miss broadcasting? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah all the time i am um, uh yeah i it's um it's i have to say i mean it's like cocaine for me you know i can't i i love it so much and it's it's one of the things that i really noticed when i was teaching at concordia that one of the um aspects of students that i wasn't expecting when I got there was that a lot of them weren't sure what they wanted to do. And I, and it, and I realized just how um, blessed makes it sound too serious, but how, how lucky I was to have found something. I mean, I think I was 17 when I first walked into a, a radio studio and I just knew immediately that this was, this is what I wanted to do. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know the details and so on, but and radio still has. I mean, after sort of, you know, going through the wrong door and doing television for um, 10 or 15 years, I, I went back to radio because I just, uh, there's something about, uh, well, I mean, it's it, this isn't a novel thought, but there's something about the, uh, the intimacy of it. Um, and I can still hear the whoosh of that door closing on, on a studio. And it was yeah. just like, you're in your own world and it was yeah i sure i miss it yeah we talk about that continually here and um, yeah people, people were looking forward to hearing from you on facebook and uh, new brunswick came up a couple of times tell us about new brunswick god is, is that where you um, actually started was it in fredericton after unb uh yeah with the cbc yeah i i remember they used to have cbc owned and operated stations so yes, tell uh, us the story peter the ID story. <laughs> no, no. The ID so, story. So, well, you knew I'd bring it up. Yeah, I know you. So the, <laughs> so I started really at a place called Woodstock, New Brunswick. CJCJ was an owned, CBC owned and operated, which meant that it owned, like it, it owned the station, and we were allowed to take a certain amount of programming from the CBC. Um, and then I, then I joined CBC in Fredericton. So, all right, Dave. The, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so we were the transmitter in Fredericton served St. John which was known as CBD and Fredericton was CBZ um, and so at the end that you know those 30 second breaks you'd about the 20 second mark you would turn off St. John and say you're listening to CBZ Fredericton you would turn on St. John turn off Fredericton and say you're listening to CBD St. John. Right. And it was the first, or I don't know if it was the very first, but it was very early on. And I panicked. I mean, because when you when you have no idea of, of the clock and 20 seconds, and am I going too long? And you, you start freaking out. And I blurted out, you're listening to CB dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that is just, boy, I'll tell you. And the career that led to. <laughs> that's right <laughs> i survived well, yeah, hey, you guys got something in common you worked in up in sudbury peter yes oh did oh, you I love sudbury. where did you that's that's my hometown where did you work in sudbury oh, really yeah. well when cbc uh opened in sudbury um i think a, a guy you guys know bill akerley was the was the manager oh, i think he that's yeah. yeah well bill is feeding us all this stuff on facebook here too so oh, bill is paying very close attention to what we're talking about right now <laughs> Well, he, uh, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think he had been, uh, he might have been the head of the newsroom in Hamilton, uh, sort of a newly created CBC newsroom in Hamilton before Sudbury. And, uh, and so he was the manager in Sudbury. And at that time I was out in uh, uh, Calgary uh, and ready to come home. It's the first time in my life I've been homesick for the East. Um, and Bill said, uh, look, we're building this station. We need somebody to, to sort of imagine and produce a morning show. Um, are you interested? And so that's how I got to Sudbury. And I lived, uh, Yvonne, on, the, on Ramsey Lake Road. Oh, yes. I course. rented a place down at the end. And I still remember lying in bed at night hearing the loons on the lake. God. And uh, I, I loved Sudbury. And I loved the people of Sudbury. Great town, yeah. Uh, I was on a, a like a <laughs> a nightmarish uh, uh, what do you call it a charter flight to um, where the hell was it? It was in Mexico, um, Puerto Vallarta, I think. And it was like a group of teachers from uh, Scarborough, I think, and me. The boss, my boss at midday, said, "Get 
get out of here. Go and go and lie on a beach. And I, okay. So I end up, and it was just, and then about the third day in, a group arrived from Sudbury, and uh, you know we were we were best pals at the at the end of our vacation. I just I love I just I I really. Uh, cherish my time in Sudbury. Well, that's a story I, I had not heard about you. That's amazing. how many years you, had you been there <clears throat> in Sudbury? Yeah. You know, I didn't stay that long because the referendum came up in Quebec, the first one, and okay. I. Oh, it was around that just, time. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. seventy. I think it was sort of seventy nine, eighty in Sudbury, and the referendum was in eighty, right? The first. Yeah, May of nineteen eighty. Yep. In May, right? So I was I. Yeah, it's about a year, a year and a half, maybe in Sudbury. And then I really wanted, and I think Bill preceded me. I think Bill went back to um, join yeah, the newsroom in Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't remember if if he kind of suggested that I go back to, but I, I remember thinking, I don't want to miss this. I want to, you know, I'd like to be home to, to see this um, happen. So. Yeah, because you're a TMR boy, right? I Is am. Yeah. I am. Okay. And I, have to I remember you. the very first day uh, you did home run with Katie. Yeah, it was her oh, last really? day and your first. Right. The two of you, and it was on my yeah, it was on my kitchen radio. The two of you having a great chat. Had you ever met before at all? No, no, no. No, I didn't know anybody at, at CBC in Montreal. Uh, um, so it was that was a bit of an adventure. <laughs> but uh, I guess yeah, I guess they hired me to do the afternoon show then. That was the that was the gig and. The, and of course, I mean, I met people who just have become lifelong, had become lifelong friends, you know, so it was, um, it was great to be back home. And I, um, I, I, you know, I really enjoyed the decision to leave Sudbury, although it's got a really fond place in my heart. I have to tell you, you just mentioned TMR. I don't know about you guys, but during this isolation period, I mean, obviously, there's time to, to reflect on your life and, and friendships and what's been going on. And I think added to that, the retirement kind of what happens in retirement is you also, it gives you the time to sort of, you know, take a deep breath and look back at what, at, at everything that, that you did. Uh, and I got, I don't know if this has happened to you guys, but I got an email. Um, I hope it's not from, <laughs> I don't mean from the same person that wrote you, but I got an email from. <laughs> That's uh, troubling. <laughs> I got an email from um, a woman, uh, well, on Facebook, she asked to be my, to, you know, to, for me to, to be friends. And I thought, I don't, I don't know who this is. And so I sort of Googled her and, or not Googled her, but I looked her up on Facebook and she was from Town of Mount Royal. And I thought, well, okay, I just, I just don't recognize the name. So I said, yes. And then she wrote me the, the most lovely note. This is like a month into, you know, isolation saying that she had had a very bad day one day at TMR High. And it was the day that we had to go into the lab and dissect a, a frog. And this she is going to be you heartwarming, were, isn't it? <laughs> it better so be. She said, she said I, uh, you were so kind to me because I remember saying to you that um, I was having a bad day and you said, don't worry, just don't you don't have to do anything I'll you know I'll get the scalpel um and I just I you know I don't know why it touched me so much but I wrote her and I said it was so kind of you to I mean it's over 50 years now you know but I guess like all of us she's got time to sort of you know think about things and that. so that was a have you guys had anything like that well, where, I, I uh, yeah the, I, I mean I I've the, had the bad side of Facebook sorry Eva but no, no go ahead fortunately once in a while you do get don't let them push you around Eva, oh okay? it's too late for that <laughs> don't 40, let years, 40 years of this shit this typical morning host you know <laughs> typical no no if that's not it, to he's say, not a morning host <laughs> He, he got the job through a, from a work sharing program is what he got in the CBC with. It's not I was thing. on furlough. He never worked in Sudbury in his life. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Well, exactly. Yeah, well, North Bay. Sorry, no. Dave. No, 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 they, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> no, the, go ahead, you guys talk. No, no, go ahead. No, the Facebook thing, I'll just say rapidly, I get, I'm fortunate too. I have several hundred quote unquote friends, most of whom I don't know, but they've reached out because they know me from radio and TV. Same thing for Dave. Dave has a whole lot of, a whole host of those folks too. 
And I'm yeah. fortunate enough to get to get messages from people every once in a while saying, I remember you back in the day and you were on the air in such and such a time or uh, during the ice storm or this, that, and the other thing. And uh, you made me feel good or you, you, you provided me with some comfort. So I get messages like that occasionally too. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, quite, uh, it's quite heartwarming. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because Facebook can turn ugly. <laughs> oh, Christ. Down he's, down he's turning into the host again. Uh, no, but, it, but, but Facebook, as you know, Peter, too, can turn ugly really fast, right? Yeah. You get, you get folks you have to block once in a while. And, uh, yeah. you know, you can, as somebody said, I think it was. Um, it happens a lot to it? Dave, though, mostly. But, well, it's just people, you can put up puppies and people start arguing with you. So yeah. the, the well, I mean, that warming have had a few of those. Well, you, you contacted me after I made a comment on Facebook about John Bolton. And, yeah, um, that was very good too, because I'm not well, buying that book. <laughs> I missed that. Well, I'm, uh, and I thought later I, that's only the second time that I've ever kind of posted an, an opinion of mine on on Facebook, because the first time I did it was on PEI, and it was something. Uh, is it glyphosate or glyphosate? The uh, the herbicide. Roundup. That, Roundup. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's got the same sort of chemical right. com composition, um, and 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 a. And someone on the island, well, I mean, it's a long story, but I, but I got into the middle of like the, just a needlessly ugly exchange with people. And I thought, what am I, what am I doing? I don't, yeah. I mean, I just, I mean, it's in a way, I thought it's a bit like when I started cross country checkup, I thought it was a place for reasonable conversation <laughs> where people of goodwill will come together and, and really hash through some difficult uh, subjects. And I realized that, and, and I think this is only magnified by, you know, social media, is that it's an opportunity for people to attack other people and to insult them. And, and, I, and it just, I, I, I um, it's scary in a way, you know? Yeah, I, what, I, I had the feeling that you should engage people and, ha as you say, have a conversation and maybe find some common ground. But then you realize that people get so angry as you yeah. say, all they want to do is piss and spit at each other, and nobody's going to convince anything, anyone of anything. And no, that's right. And everybody's just going to go away pissed off and say, I'm never doing this again. Yeah. Good, A friend of mine said, shame. like, post pictures of lambs and kittens. That's what Facebook is. <laughs> Leave it at yeah. that. Don't, and I, I, I sort of agree with it, but I was so angry with the... Um, the kind of elevation of John Bolton into some public servant. That, uh, so I, that's why I, I wrote what I wrote. Yeah, and I we, think you pretty much said he had an ax to grind, right? He was no hero, no public servant. Oh, with God. The higher, no, no, no. This was just, no, no, uh, no. he was, and he no, saved his, it during the, he saved it during the, uh, the impeachment hearing. He, he yeah. you know, kept his powder dry yeah. because he knew he was writing a book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he's... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, can we no, double okay. back to your teaching for a second? Because it reminds mm. me of the chat we had with Jeff Vorkin. Uh, oh, yeah. Me. I'm getting, I'm going to have to hang up. I'm getting a, another call here. Uh, the chat we had with Jeff Vorkin the other day right. about the, his teaching, and I was curious about what he left behind. He said he was encouraged by the young people he was teaching and that he right. felt pretty good about the future of journalism. Do you yeah. share his... Do you share his view or his perspective? Um, yes, I mean, I, I uh, as I say, the, the one thing that surprised me about teaching was that uh, most classrooms were filled with people who weren't really sure what they wanted to do. Right. Um, so that that sort of stumped me early on, but uh, I mean, that's the only aspect that I really miss is uh, is the energy and the determination. Uh, and the passion um, and, and just the dedication of young people to trying to, to make a difference in the world with their journalism. And I, um, one of the things that I, I loved was there was an interview, uh, I'm, it was E.L. Doctorow, uh, and I think it was on Charlie Rose. And Doctorow had taught creative writing in New York forever like for 40 years or something. And, and I remember, I think it was Rose, asked him, what is it about teaching? That I mean, what keeps you going? You don't have to do this. And he said, it reminds me of my early struggles and of my beginnings. Uh, 
and I thought that's 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 my experience too. You know that, and I think what he was saying was it it teaches you not only humility, but it teaches you a, it re- prevents you from becoming calcified, because because students are always challenging. Uh, maybe the way you did things, uh, maybe maybe the role of journalism, and it and you have to stay if you're really engaged with them. You have to you have to listen and you have to try to accommodate what they want to do with, you know, kind of the practical side of here's, here's how to do it. Um, but no, I was, I was just energized. Uh, I, I miss the classroom um, almost as much as radio. Okay. I was curious about that because we were talking about social yeah. media and that's, that's omnipresent now too, in the way that uh, uh, news comes together. And, right. And that, uh, people... Well, Yvonne, I think the really, um, and I'm, I'm trying to write about this and I've been kind of uh, um, researching this off and on. I think the, uh, the, the concept of what it means to know something, I think is really changing. Yes. Um, and I mean, the standard answer to how do you know something has been teaching, but now uh, it's looking something up. And I, I mean, it, this came to me when a colleague of mine at Concordia, a young guy, uh, came up to see me here in Montebello and he made it here like in record time. And I said, like, how did you get here? You know what? He couldn't, he couldn't really tell me because all he had done was, you know, on GPS, he had put his address in. And I thought, so knowing something isn't the ability to look it up. Knowing something is deeper than that. And I think that's the real challenge for universities. Uh, not that they, I mean, they don't need another challenge, but in, in the age of just look it up, uh, you've got to, you've got to engage. I mean, to me, I think imagination is a really big part of learning. Uh, and what looking something up, what Google, what Googling something does is it kind of erases your imagination. You don't need an imagination because you just, if you just want the facts, but, uh, Knowledge without imagination, um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's. It's, and I'm careful with these terms. I don't think it's real knowledge. I think you have to. I mean, experience is part of it. You have to be able to think about these really complex things before you say, "Well, I know that." You know. Does and knowledge make is really transient, Peter. Right, and getting more so. I mean, what what may be fact, if you will now can change in the process of a 24-hour news cycle and a 24 yeah. second dead news wrong cycle. the next day yeah 24 yeah. minute news cycle yeah that's yeah the yeah i have to say i mean i i am um, you know you try to put a brave face on it in the classroom but, but it's a tough i mean i never told them there were no jobs because i don't believe that i think if you're good and you have the right attitude and you're and you're prepared to stop looking at the clock and it's not nine to five and you throw yourself at it, you'll find work in, you know, any, in any, on any platform. Um, but I, I think they, uh, uh, it's, yeah, I just think that, that they're, they're, they get a bit lost in, in, well, don't we all in this kind of yeah. hail, this hurricane of information. Yep. It's a I mean, maelstrom. It's a full, well, it's a full-time never job. Stops. Try, yep. Just trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah. What's, How do you what's triage right? all this stuff? Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, that yeah. that to me is a, is a really really big challenge. And the other thing that I, because I used to run the graduate program at Concordia, so I would meet like incredibly accomplished young people who made me feel like a slug in this graduate program, and they would um, they would and I, like I had to interview them all and decide who to invite, and I would always try to get like international representatives to come to come into the program because I, I thought their perspective was really important for you know our students Quebec students to to hear and to be exposed to and I, almost to a person these graduate students would arrive with uh, I mean it was kind of a, a naive thought but it's one that uh, I, I call me naive but I think that good journalism makes a difference somewhere every day in the world so i believe in it and i believe in public broadcasting to my to my core and i started talking to these graduate students about um and this is not my this is not my um uh, thinking uh, 
originally, I, I, there is a movement uh, towards global journalism. And there is a sort of scholarship on uh, what it means to be a global journalist. And it just shifts your responsibilities as a journalist. So instead of, you know, if you're in Montreal, that you're trying to reach the community in Montreal, if, you're, if you adopt the principles and the values of global journalism, you're addressing the world with your work. You know, because Fukushima is not a local news story. You know, Chernobyl wasn't a local news story. So, and increasingly, and especially with environmental stories, uh, there's no such thing as a, as a local story. So, <clears throat> and the response from the grad students was, um, really enthusiastic. But then, you know, my time at Concordia came to an end. So I, I couldn't stay and build this, uh, b build this um, uh, new program. But I, but I think that's where, I don't know if Jeff mentioned, uh, Jeffrey mentioned anything about that, but I think that's the survival of journalism is to take a broader perspective. Yeah, yeah. We, could, we could go yeah. on a long time about local, this. Local. I mean, Jeff, I just Jeff's have... writing a textbook. Uh, yeah. Is there a book in you somewhere there, Peter? Um, uh, uh, yes, I, I hope so. Um, you know, I'm, I've, as I say, I've been, I've been looking at this idea of learning or knowledge, um, uh, and I haven't quite, I'm not satisfied with, with the questions um, uh, that I'm asking myself yet. But yeah, I'm always writing and I'm, and I'm always reading and I'm always, uh, uh, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to stay engaged with issues and uh, one of, I mean, my passion is interviewing and I haven't come across the book about interviewing that kind of rang true with me. And Dave, you, well, both of you probably know, but there's something really human about the act of an interview and the scholarly textbooks used in universities and probably community colleges tends to you know be very clinical and it, and it's i tell you i mean I, I i used to tell students this that i remember interviewing gary hart <clears throat> excuse me once and it was just after the monkey business you remember when he got on the boat yeah right. and and the person his handler said don't ask him about i can't remember what was the woman's name? Donna? I think Donna something. Oh, that was yeah. the woman you know that he was with. So on... far back, I can't remember. I do remember the name Gary Hart, though. He was the first. Well, I'm old, line. Dave. I'm old, Dave. So, yes, it's far back. <laughs> Tell us about anyway, FDR. I... <laughs> so I asked him, like, how could a guy of his experience, how in the world did you not know not to get on a boat? with someone who wasn't your wife and the boat's called monkey business and the air left the room. I mean, honest to God. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I mean, I, if I ever get a chance to talk to young people about interviewing, the first thing I'm going to say is that it takes courage. Yeah. For a because real That's the question, no matter what his handler said that hung in the air that you had to ask Gary Hart, Absolutely. you know, how's your golf I game, Gary, who cares? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I always thought I was the representative of the average person at home. And I would try to ask questions that if I was driving in the car listening to something that I would want asked. But it's, um, I mean, it, it's just such a, uh, an in, um, integral part, I think, of a good conversation, is that you put yourself out there a little bit. And um, if it works, fine. And if it doesn't, like with Gary Hart, I mean, there's an awkward moment, but but, but you, yeah. you know, it, it was real. I mean, it was at least it was a real moment. Well, I mean, people listening at home would have said, you know, Downey, Downey blew it if you didn't ask that. And you don't have to be argumentative and you don't have to be contentious. Right. But you got to ask the question that's on your mind because right. you're right. involved. But, but, but what's on the mind of the people listening? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing is just to listen. I mean, that, you know, the, and it's it sounds like it sounds so simple. But, you know, especially in television, I found with all the, all the people around you, it's, it's, a, it's the hardest thing to do in the world. You know, when you've got people sort of pointing, telling you how much time is left, and, you know, I, it's, it's very distracting. And, and so you've got to listen to what people are saying to you, and you've got to respond to that. And that's where, I mean, to me, that's where Barbara Frum's skill was just impeccable. Um, she stuck to the to the storyline that she wanted to pursue, but if somebody said something that, that do you remember her interview with the who was the guy that gave steroids to Ben Johnson? 
I can see him, but I can't remember yeah. his name. Yeah. But but yeah. Barbara, and they I, found out after the Soul Games about it. Uh, Jesus. No. Anyway, I did, but Barbara interviewed him, and um, I mean we all did at the time. But I remember her interview because he said he he tried to say that it was really nothing, and and she just I mean she was she was um, direct uh, and real and fair, and what I I mean I don't know you know let's not sort of, I don't want to go be seen as complaining about everything today but what I hear a lot is go to question three you know go to question eight and it's it's like a script it's like a theater script it's not a real engagement so that's I've been I uh, to get back to what Yvonne asked <laughs> do I want to write anything I would really love to write a book about uh, about that about interviewing because well, to I me if you're right you should and you should title you should. listen you really yeah, should. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, bang on. So one final question, or, or I have a, something to tell you. I know how the guy got from Montreal to where you are because he drove like you. Oh, you don't remember when you drove me back from the townships? We made it back from Lennoxville in about 35 minutes. <laughs> I'm a busy man. He's got things to do. <laughs> what the he's got shit to do. You know, like, like shade. Like we can't. Sorry, all Peter. Wall. Hung in the air. We can't loll around like Bronsted. I mean, Dave, we have things. Yvonne and I are busy. We got shit to Dave, do, man. We have things to do. Dave got out of bed forty-five minutes ago. Downey's been you out know? feeding the goats since about seven. Well, I know. He goes out and plucks a few flowers. <laughs> Cut the, that's not a real garden, by no. the way. <laughs> I think, Dave. I took it over the neighbors. Dave, I would be, I just, as a friend, get some help. <laughs> Putting up photos of British gardens and claiming they're your backyard. See, Yvonne, I told you he was just like you. I know. He was just, he was just like me. That's why I like Peter so much. Peter, thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, and next time, the golf game. Oh, is that another story oh, that, uh, oh, that Aker Lee? Uh, Akerley's well, no, just just how good he's got. Akerley's taking notes now. There's paper flying <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. It's been right. a real pleasure. Peter, thanks. Talk to you like soon. You thanks a lot, Peter. Thanks. That was great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the invitation. Great for chatting. Cheers. Oh my. Yeah, I'm, gl he, uh, I'm glad he, he was in a good about mood. What he thinks about. Yes, I'm glad. Oh, he was Peter's in a good always mood. in a good mood. But. Uh, uh, but uh, no, he doesn't suffer fools gladly, and no. uh, th that's no. uh, I don't know him nearly as well as you do. But that's one thing that I learned quite quickly. So uh, and that's something we. It's have amazing uh, how he talked uh, because we've both been television babies too, but I think Pe we're, we're we another thing we have in common with Peter, uh, apart from the fact that we're all sensational broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Is that no? There, there's, there's something in your heart about radio, as yep. Peter says. Television is a bunch of distractions, and it gets the. But uh, I, I just, I loved radio. I didn't yep. like the hours. I started. But uh, I, loved I was it. six, seventeen, sixteen, seventeen years old at the time too. So it goes way back for me. Anyway, yeah. anyway, lovely of, of, and I was, I wanted to hear him uh, on journalism, um, and I wanted to hear him, uh, respond to what, uh, what Jeffrey was suggesting too. And I'm encouraged, uh, by what he's saying about uh, the young people he was teaching and working with, because it's, uh, I am often discouraged by what I read and what I see on the air and what I see on. Yeah. Well, he made two very good points. I think which we made with Jeff is they're dealing with a hell of a lot more than we did when we went, you know, it sounds yeah. like horse and buggy, which I don't want to be too condescending about our era, but also he said, no, they're jo if you can write and you've got imagination and you've got a bit of smarts and some drive, there are jobs out there. Yeah. I, there are a lot more media involved than there were, and you know we yep. had a choice of one or the other. Yep, I'm encouraged to hear that. So, all right. So uh, tomorrow, uh, a few odds and ends. Uh, the Dick Van Dyke Show. I've got a whole raft of stuff on Dick Van what Dyke. What made you fall onto that? You just I don't know. To be I just looking around. To, I get bored, at, uh, and I start looking around at the very streaming things. For some reason, uh, Amazon picked up on the, the Beverly Hillbillies Prime. and Dick Van Dyke on Prime. And they've got the first series. 
And I've got some weird things to share with you tomorrow on Dick Van Dyke. Okay, well, things. I have huge, huge stories with great uh, import. Okay. Uh, three of them at least. Thank you very much. Uh, to share with you. Uh, and I'm going to be to researching for most of the for rest most of, the of the day, early into the yes. hours tomorrow. Good. Now so I'm going back to bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>